Okay, we're now at chapter two of Mankind Child of the Stars by Max Flint and Otto o Binder uh, Space Clues. The previous chapter reviewed the various shortcomings of Darwin's theory in regards to explaining man, the misfit of evolution, and the investigated the strong evidence that man may be a star cross breed of two worlds. And of course I've argued that that doesn't necessarily mean it's from the stars. <coughs> but may appear that it's coming from the stars. Now we take up a second part of the theory and that mankind is a colony and that we humans are a colony of star men that can, that conscious by conscious design or plan that's still being withheld from the earth people why the colony and the secrecy perhaps it would be best to explain with a brief tale many millions or perhaps billions of years ago a and no human on earth knows how many light years away because I don't believe light years either. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not so. I just uh, don't believe in the math. Um, man evolved on a distant plane, planet or plane. <laughs> they were people as human as we are. In a short space of time, say 100,000 years after his early ancestors, Star Man arrived at our present state of development. For something like one to five hundred thousand years more, he continued to develop socially, politically, and scientifically. Then in time, his planet became too small, too cold, too crowded for him, and he colonized one or more young nearby planets. Eventually, perhaps, millions years later, he had uh, a had to move again. His planet was losing its atmosphere, or perhaps population pressure was the cause. But then came the saving discovery. Starman's mind was marvelous and highly developed, far beyond the capabilities of our present day earthly minds. At the same time, unfortunately, Starman's body was totally inadequate. For pioneering for the for pioneering jobs of other planets, this discovery forced Starman to make a momentous decision. Mankind, as a race, would henceforth be divided into two branches, as a means, only means, of preserving the race. There would be an ancestral race. The keepers of wisdom and knowledge, the pursuers of scientific inquiry. The other race, a hybridized colonial race, would always be physically more able, but also always mentally inferior to the ancestral race. And so time passed while the star man spread. Planet after planet was colonized, then discarded on the course of time as its atmosphere drifted away or as it became cold or otherwise unsuitable. Many millions of years passed. The system of colonizing became standardized and very successful. Scientific progress continued. The search for ever stronger physical specimens with which to colonize the planets gradually grew into the system we are partly aware of here on earth today which we call evolution but which is in reality a part of colonization namely plan evolved through planned evolution through artificial hybridization contact between the ancestral race and each inter uh, stellar colony was never permitted in the beginning in the sense that no colony was ever allowed to know it had been created. However, 
when the colony evolved into a sufficient fishes into a sufficiently mature form and ventured into space under its own impetus conscious contact was at last permitted the reason for this apparently unreasonable procedure of security was as follows man learns best that which he learns for himself in his own good time and this is just as true for the earth today and its problems as it is for one of our e youngsters growing up so the colonies of the other worlds grew politically scientifically and philosophically and in other words and in other ways important to ancestral race they grew along these paths by trial and error, learning and gaining mental stature, just as we have done for several thousands of years here on Earth. And when the time arrived for the colony to become aware of the presence of other intelligences throughout the universe and to begin the process of probing outward to meet and communicate with these other people, we are close to that position today then at last the first knowing contact could be made between the ancestral race and the colony from then on for some period of time the new world gasped at the wonderment at the seemingly endless success of marvels that came to bless its scientific and cultural life Gradually, the purpose of the colony became clear to, uh, to the inhabitants. The colony was to act as a host to the ancestral race, a willing host, because in return for doing the uh, spade work desired, of, desired by the ancestral race, the colony was given a, the marvelous super scientific knowledge gleaned through eons of time the philosophical wisdom, the social achievements, and the political astuteness, and all such finer benefits. Thus the colony fulfilled its destiny and became one more of the endless successions of planets chosen to be the home of the original interstellar man. And there the tale ends. This is not meant to be a authentic version of how original man or star man spread through the universe. Naturally, it must be mainly guess, guesswork, but certain fundamentals are presented that we believe are true. That man evolved elsewhere in space, or in another dimension or realm, that's what I added that. That he, in time, colonized many other worlds, and that on each he used some form of crossbreeding or biogenetic manipulation literally to create rational life ahead of its slow evolutionary time. <clears throat> we now see that this second colonization part of the theory along with the first hybrid part offers explanations for all the topic heading of chapter one it would be wise to note that the main attraction of this story and the theory it gives a rise to is that it reinforces mankind's strong feeling of special destiny his sense of preordained superiority among living things therefore this theory tends to be relatively compatible with Darwin's work, at the same time partly removing the one feature of his theory the public found repulsive in the extreme that man has descended from monkeys. This theory, this hybrid theory proposes that man is not quite as bestial as that phrase implies, and in fact that man ascended from the apes through the crossbreeding program of the wise ultra-intelligent planet hoppers who 
visited Earth long ago. Further, not quite as obvious, but equally as important, is the implication that if we can only get out of get out into space, meet our ancestors, acquire their knowledge and their timeless surpassing wisdom, and then perhaps peace on earth, goodwill to man can be our forevermore. But all of the preceding, of course, hinges on one looming question. Is there life and intelligence elsewhere in the universe? Is the rest of the cosmos filled only with dead plant planets whirling around their fierce suns? Fear, furious suns. Fear, furious suns. Fear suns. Or are there other wor worlds pr pr uh, or is there other worlds propitious to life, propitious to life, where living things sprang up as they did on Earth? And where does life come from in the first place and on any right planet? Did the primeval atmosphere of Earth containing several gases, hydrogen, methane, ammonia, carbon dioxide, among others, act as a giant chemical laboratory and accidentally toss together atoms to make molecules. Did these molecules shuffle around in violent waters under fierce heat and radiation until they formed the first organic compounds? Then, finally, did those compounds further unite to form Ammonium acid, the basic unit of protein, which is a living matter. Which is living matter. Such is one theory of life's gene genesis on Earth. And it could happen on any other world similar to Earth and with compar comparable conditions. In fact, biologists and biochemists almost unanimously agree that such Earth-like planets could not remain sterile, that life must spring up on them, given sufficient atoms and molecules that are basic to life, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, carbon monoxide, excuse me, carbon dioxide, and billions and billions of years billion year stretches of time for random forces to juggle them together into a fierce first bits of li living protein I don't know about all that but it's quite imaginative more importantly the process can no longer stop there by theory it continues uh, until the first pri primitive one cell creature creatures are formed in the condensing seas of the planets making an organic soup now the classic process of evolution building up of life forms and takes over and the tiny cell and tiny single cell cells form larger aggregates that become increasingly complex as nature stirs the brew invertebrates, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. It may all be a sort of inevitable pattern that occurs on any or all Earth-like worlds. Always remember the louche. However, another theory of life's origin has recently sprung up, tied in with cosmo cosmology. So that the evolution of the material universe and life itself become strangely interwoven. And we have to always remember the interdimensional and the spiritual. For some reason we don't want to. Um, this theory is in reality a re revival of the concept. A century old when. I don't even know how to pronounce his name. But I guess, guess it's. Sante, uh, Sante, Sante um, Arrhenius, 
the famed 19th century chemist uh, propounded his theory of panspermia. And let's see if I can get his name right, because just for my own learning, and uh, so I don't just pretend I know how I'm saying somebody's name. And as you know, I suck at reading. Sante Arrhenius. He says it's Swedish author. And let's see what happens. Pronunciation. And I'm sure I pronounced it completely wrong. Let's find one that's not going to zap me. How to pronounce. Svante Arrhenius. Svante Arrhenius. Svante Arrhenius. Svante Arrhenius. Svante. So we'll just say Svante Arrhenius. Arrhenius, the famed 19th century uh, chemist, propounded his theory of panspermia. In belief, he, he envisioned tiny life buds and virus-like spores that were waft, wafted through space, haft, waft, waft through space by the pressure of light waves from star suns if they landed on a ripe world ready for life the spores came out of their uh, sp uh, suspended animation and formed a formed one cell life which then again launched the whole climb of species up the evolutionary ladder Oddly enough, this seemingly way out theory has recently been taken up and expanded upon by serious scientists. John A. Ball, a Harvard of, Howard, of Harvard, brings forth a peculiar fact well known to evolutionists that spontaneous generation of new life has utterly stopped for ages as if evolution... itself has come to an abrupt halt he then offers an astounding conjecture quote most ev evolutionists believe that it is life was generated long ago but perhaps it never was perhaps the earth was infected from elsewhere in the beginning end of quote Two other leading lights of biological science published a paper in which they suggested that living spores did not merely drift through space, but came as colonies of microorganisms sent in a protective unmanned spacecraft by intelligent beings elsewhere and deliberately aimed at Earth. There are two strong points favoring this concept. One is that all life on Earth has a uniform gen genetic code in its most basic DNA form. From ammonia to man, if life had formed spontaneously on Earth, it seems more than likely that several kinds of genetic codes would have arisen. The universal genetic codes says that scientists could be compatible with the idea of a single ancestral source, such as ancest ancient microorganisms dumped on Earth by spacecraft, thus seeding our planet with life. The second odd point is that molybdenum, mal, uh, a very rare metal, plays an important role as a trace element in the physiology of all earth creatures. It is surprising therefore that life so dependent on a rare metal should arise on a melodium poor world like earth 
rather than on some world rich in that metal, a world from which perhaps the micro seeding originated. What has excited astronauts and cosmo, 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 cosmologists in the past 10 years is the amazing discovery of organic gases in empty space, existing as gigantic clouds along with dust and debris between the stars. They are extremely attenuated gases so that space is all still almost empty but our galaxy is so huge in volume that the total aggregate of the scattered atoms and molecules runs into staggering tons almost beyond count. Radio telescopes were the first to detect the spectral lines of hydrogen gas in the open areas of space and thus opening a new branch of science called molecular astronomy. As of May 1974, some 29 different substances have been detected of outer space. Of course, there's vastly more now, right, allegedly. There will probably be more by the time you read this. Among the detected substances are such organic radicals, parts of organic molecules and pre-organic molecules which make up the living matter as water, ammonia, and uh, that would be NH3, uh, formaldehyde, which is H2CO, uh, methyl, methyl alcohol, CH2OH and acetyl acetyl dehydrate. I guess that's how I pronounce it. Acetyl dehyde acetylhyde. Excuse me. CH2 CHO. It's ironic thing. It's in school and college and university. I took all this organic chemistry classes and I forgot all of it. Mine, it's been nearly 30 years, so I hadn't much use for it, so. Biochemists must be utterly astounded that such complex organic substances can f exist in the cold, empty reaches of space itself. For by a variant of the panspermia theory, organic chemicals rather than spores can descend on any planet whirling through the space cloud uh, to have its seas saturated with the building blocks of protoplasm. Remember this is a theory and you think beyond that theory and you say maybe it's all happening just above us. What if we are in a simulation? What if those stars are just a, uh, a light show for us? And the other side of the light show, another side of that wall of what seems like ice there's something else going on, and somehow they know how to open some it some way, somehow, portals, rip in fabric, time, space, and dump this shit on us. In fact, there's multiple ways of thinking this way, of thinking, so. But it's worth thinking <laughs> and listening to other people's pers perspectives. The discovery of an increasing number of organic molecules in interstellar space, reports Science News, has led a number of scientists to suggest that the first chemical steps in the evolution of life ha may have taken place in the interstellar clouds. Another fascinating hypothesis is that of Dr. J. Mayo Greensburg of New York State University, who set up a laboratory experiment in which he produced grains of chemical debris comparable to the estimated size of grains of dust, space dust. He then arranged for the grains to collide under ultraviolet light, rampant in space, and found he could produce molecules of high molecular weight. He thinks this mechanical as assertion process in giant 
in, in giant in interstellar dust clouds could produce grains of a size or composition similar to viruses, which we know there's no such thing. There's no story. He concludes. His conclusion is that here may be a very the very origin of life itself, out of the coloss, colossal chemical laboratory between stars. Hence, according to the, this laboratory, every planet in the universe is floating through this thin space soup, which can trigger off life in warm seas of any or all suitable planets. Life is then not the exception but the rule throughout the myriad of star families of planets. The enti entirely different clue leading an entirely different clue leading to this same deduction comes from the exa the examination of the merch Murchison meteorite. I don't know if I said that right. Murchison, 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 the Murchison meteorite, which fell to Earth in 1970. The scientists and of the um, fame Ames, I guess it would be Ames Research Center of NASA, have found definite traces of ammonia acid you know, it's come from NASA so a big question mark with all that building blocks of living protein in the meteorite substantiate later by the researchers of two universities two scientists of Arizona State University independently examined another meteorite that fell near Murray, Kentucky in 1950 and detected the presence of all 18 of the known amino acids. They also found two um, pyrimidines oh god pyrimidines pyrimidines that are basic ingredients of the nucleic acid vital to living cells. Significantly, those meteor meteoric acid, amino acids and pi pi nah, pyrimidines. That's what it stands. So I am not saying that word right. Pyrimidines. Pyrimidines. Okay, so amino acids and pyrim pyrimidines. Pyramidines have a nuclear structure different from earthly types of various esoteric ways, such as left or right config configurations. Hence, they are living matter not of this earth, and almost a dead sure clue of extraterrestrial life. I like the esoteric part, huh? The uh, conscious. Uh, the conscious is that the consensus is that these findings enormously increase the likelihood of life elsewhere in the universe. I take a break here. Yeah, open up the shades. It's getting light out. Okay, I'm just uh, done with my break here. Even before the great breakthrough discovery of organic compounds and no longer lifeless space, astronomers and cosmologists were convinced by other evidence not only that living worlds were widespread and throughout the galaxy, but also that an immense number of them had evolved thinking beings who might be singling, singling their brother back worlds. The brother worlds, excuse me. Back in 1960, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, Project Ozma, 
under the leadership of Dr. Frank Drake, Drake uh, attempted to pick up intelligent signals from two nearby stars, uh, Tau Ceti, Ceti and Epsilon uh, Erande, I guess that's how you pronounce them. Results were negative, but now in the works uh, is Project Cyclops, an international endeavor including Russia and United States, which may cost up to $5 billion and involve no less than 10,000 radio telescopes, dishes, and antennas. Perhaps its mission would be to add a new dimension to cosmology. It might establish the science of biological cosmology namely set up a communication between intelligent biological beings on different worlds. If top-notch sober scientists boldly ask for enormous sums of five billion to set up apparatuses to contact other civilizations in outer space, then surely they must be going by more than flimsy clues that such civilization exists, or maybe they're using it to oppress us as well. That could be the case, right? Or for other reasons, more sinister, nefarious reasons. You never know what it was back then. They certainly didn't offer up what they said. They were trying to, what they, this guy is saying. And they may, in time, to their, their own surprise, receive a staggering message from the very star men who colonized Earth long ago and created hybrid man. Hence, the discovery of organic space clouds was only a confirming factor in, the, in a belief that scientists have almost unanimously held a, for a quarter century. This belief is based on certain astronomical data about stars that statistically indicate more than half of them must have planets revolving about them as our sun with its family of planets. I question all that, but it doesn't matter what I think. One of the first famed astronomers to speculate about the presence of life on other planets in our outer universe was Dr. Harlow Shapley. Harlow Shapley. Shapley, excuse me former head of the Harvard University Astronomy Department, who is his, who in his famous book of Stars and Man states, quote, exactly, it doesn't, say, it doesn't quote it, so we'll just, they might have, okay. Exactly where these uh, other life-bearing planets are, we cannot now say. Perhaps we never can. Lost as they are in the glare of their stars isolated as uh, as we are in space and equipped with sounding apparatuses that is still we hope primitive and will prove although not seen or photographed those planets are deduced as statistical probabilities and we can lie through statistics. We know that. There must be at least 100,000 of them in our galaxy if we accept a frequency uh, the writer prefers. Then it says it's in quotes. So I guess so. Okay. Is it in quotes? Is it in, oh, eight. Must be. Okay. This estimate, esti this estimate, this estimate of Dr. Shapley's is so conservative that it amounts to no more than one populated star per million in our galaxy. He ignored the, that paragraph of the rest of the universe, and he knew that the universe contains 10 billion other galaxies. More recent estimates are truly mind-staggering. We find in our population that statements of Dr. 
Harrison H. Brown of the Division of Geographic, Geological Sciences, California Institute of Technology, Pasadena. He estimates that virtually every star in our galaxy has a planetary system, and each of which from two to four planets might have an Earth-like environment and chemistry that encourages other kinds of life to exist. He gives the enormous figure of 100 billion stars with planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. That would mean two, 200 to 400 billion planets like Earth or perhaps Mars on which life would almost certainly arise. He also makes another startling observation. And of course, these are all speculations. These are all guesses, right? And so we see a startling observation that because a large part of the theorized mass of the universe is missing, there may exist innumerable dark stars or suns that have burned out and are thus invisible to our optical telescopes. Dr. Shiv S. Coomer of the Gatter Institute for Space Studies, like a Jesuit, uh, in New York City, ha has also speculated along this line and hypothesizes that the invisible or dark stars may outnumber the visible stars by 20 to 1. Dr. Harlow Shapley himself did not ignore this possibility and also spoke of many millions of tiny unseen stars um, sparkled through the vast reaches of space, hanging between the giant burning sun we see. He added boldly that it would not it, it was not impossible that life would exist on the surface of these dark and cold stars which would be in the nature of large planets but circulating no sun Cir but circulate but circling no sun and some of these living stars would be s statistical certainties by statistical certainty be between the earth and alpha centauri uh, and uh, the so-called nearest star which is somewhat over four light years away, about 25 trillion miles. You believe those numbers? It is quite a mind boggling thought that small dust, small dark sun planets that have given rise to life may be close neighbors within a mere light year or two of Earth, if you believe light years making the possibility of aliens alien visits even more likely because as we have seen any planet that first spawns life at all almost certainly will produce intelligent beings simply because evolution cannot stop at any point or because the coloniz colonizing starmen have visited those dark sun planets too Dr. Shapley brings forth a really earth-shaking idea when he states, quote, There is no reason not to believe that the biochemical evolution on one half of the suitable planets has equal or attained much greater technological development than here on Earth. This means that more than half of his estimated 100,000 inhabited plants, planets excuse me, in our galaxy are occupied by people who are uh, chronologically and thus according to Darwin's intellectually more advanced than we are. Obviously since we have already started an astronautic program spaceflight has been known by the inhabitants of some of these planets for thousands or millions of years now, I don't believe we're going I think that's water I think that's the reason why they trained in those damn 
giant swimming pools is because it's water up there it ain't freaking space what they're saying so but just remember everything there's little details here even though i might disagree with 90 percent of what this guy saying that that one percent is worth a nugget of truth and to see things clearly is good i don't have to agree with everything this guy says in fact i'm not gonna i can tell you right now but saying that the idea of uh hybrid hybrid man that makes sense how about it what's really out there that's a whole nother story and, and knowing that how we've been lied to about every other damn thing they've ever said when it comes to the oligarchs the plutocracy and the the managers of this plantation why should i believe anything that they say saying that now that doesn't mean there's not some validity in any of this well instead of thinking of space let's think of aquatic uh, life form there maybe with this the only spaces between our ears that could be the case by the way obviously since we have already started an astronomical program space flight has a bit blah blah blah, blah. Um, now the mystery is, here is at least the mystery to orthodox science why have we not been visited the answer is we probably have been visited and that ne neatly solved and that neatly solves the mystery if science estimate will only accept it well what if we're not visited by star people but from people from other dimensions and this is where you're going to tie this in with what book i just read which is how to ha how you know what Adventures uh, um, of the uh, body experience, whatever the hell it's called. Um, yeah, maybe we're dealing with something that's completely different than what they're telling us. Because they lie to us about everything else, gosh darn it. Anyways, the answer is we probably have is blah, blah, blah. No, it, it, this it is not a reference to the controversial flying saucers or and unidentified flying objects that have been in and out of the news for more than 25 years although we shall now that what it would be now it would be 60 from that based on that number it would be um i lost the train of thought it's 45 48 25 uh which would be 53, 73 plus years, more than that, for oh, near a quarter of a, of a century, nearly a quarter of a century, let's put it that way. Still, these questions linger. That's because I think we're once again going down, they're be, we're being forced to go down the wrong path. The controllers would be the uh, these entities, these archons, these spirits, these beings, these aliens, whatever. The, the manager of this simulation, they don't want us to know them for some reason. Maybe because they feed off us somehow, some way. Maybe we're the food for them. Just a question, just a statement, just an observation, and not saying it's so. Okay, uh, UFOs aside, even hard-nosed scientists believe we may have had at least one space visitor in, in recent times. A very huge and puzzling meteorite fell thunderously in Sylvia, uh, uh, Siberia on July 30th, 1908, and fortunately fell in a remote and uninhabited woodland which probably was deliberate by the way um, but peasants heard the awesome explosion as far as 620 miles away a large area of the forest was flattened as if an immense object had fallen it was put down as a giant meteorite until several Soviet expeditions began exploring the site in 1921 on they found a series of strange mysteries. No re remnants of the alleged meteor, right, could be found anywhere underground. 
maybe this is the reason why we're starting to, maybe we're starting to have seen these cryptids and these aliens and everything huh maybe these are the passengers of this place this thing that fell second radioactivity had initially been released in enormous amounts third the general destruction showed that the energy release had been far greater than the mere impact of a falling stone no matter how huge most significantly the aerial path of the falling object had not been uniform but had seemingly changed during descent various soviet scientists then put forth an amazing theory that this <clears throat> had been a spacecraft driven by intelligent beings and loaded with great power from a nuclear power plant <clears throat> which had exploded th through some through some accident or a variant of this was that an, an Antimatter spacecraft had attempted to land on Earth and had met a f the fate of antimatter particles when they met norm norm matter particles instantly instant annihilation. However, most scientists are dubious about any recent visits uh, by star men, preferring to consider that this happened only in uh, ancient times. Why? Dr. Albert Einstein, for instance, stated that he was in complete sympathy with the idea of a visit by spacemen back in prehistoric times. Then, when we come to the words of an international acclaimed scientist of today, Dr. Carl Sagan, planet science, sciences, science expert of Cornell University, in a monumental book jointly written with a Soviet scientist, Sagan estimates that super technological starmen with interstellar spaceships may have visited Earth, hold your breath, some 5,000 years since life first proliferated on the Earth 500 million years ago. 5,000 times, but if we divide that into 500 million years, we get one visitation every 100,000 years, so he is not suggesting a constant flow of starships back uh, and forth. The reason his sus he suspects visitation from space is an account of the sudden uprise of civilizations in Samaria, the uh, CA 8000 10,000 BC. There are legends he cites as almost direct evidence that starmen landed there and launched mankind on a road to civilization. Sagan's speculations of course immensely bolstered the theory of the hybrid man as a star colony even if unwittingly on his own on his part in the talk before in a talk before american rocket society in 1962 sagan also gave in the more accepted figure of how many civilized worlds should exist in our galaxy alone, one million as a minimum. Now, an odd thought arises. How many of those inhabited, inhabit, inhabited worlds are also colonies of the star men who colonized our Earth? This brings up a new picture about the origin of life throughout space. Perhaps life did not spring up independently on each or every world. We can assume that one or several planets were among the earliest uh, form from out of the amorphous condensing galaxy between 10 to 25 billion years ago. Cosmologists do not yet agree on the age of the macro universe. 
if the life if life first arose whether earth bred from primary biochemistry or from space cloud organic chemicals is not relevant on just a few worlds and flowered into human and human like intelligence then they may have achieved space travel and eventually explored the entire galaxy not waiting for the slow process of life arising spontaneously from organic soup and, or, or life clouds they may have seeded many planets with primeval life and as in the planet hopping theory given before they then colonize other worlds including earth whatever the true answer is many scientists have stated their belief like sagan that our galaxy as well as all others inevitably simply teems with life and with super technological worlds many of them talk of vast organizations of U united worlds who cooperate with their neighbors in stupendous projects like galaxy exploration and colonization our star man who our star men who produced hybrid man on earth may thus actually be a group of advanced worlds who jointly colonize our planets this these are profound revelations we may not be told for some time to come and when we can withstand the shock without blowing our minds but orthodox and opinionated science as yet is not ready to accept any such radical explanation for the genesis of intelligent life on earth however the real joker is that they still unconsciously supply grist for our mill in their general beliefs about the cosmos soviet scientists have taken a step beyond other scientists in their attempts to contact the postulated civilizations in outer space their huge radio telescope assemblies both ra ra radio it's not radio radial plus radial dishes and linear antennas antenna have for several years been trying to pick up non-random or patterned signals which would in instantly indicate other sentinel, sentinel beings deliberately sending such signals several times soviet radio astronomers tentatively announced exciting signals that seem apart from natural ones especially in connection with pulsar pulsars stars that that particularly pulsate in the radio spectrum with an intricate set of frequencies that are so utterly precise they seem man-made but theory indicated rather sh shakily shakily the pulsar that pulsars could send such patterns purely by natural nuclear processes but that did not discourage the soviet researchers and on october 16 1973 uh, tas T-A-S-S, TASS, the official bulletin of the Soviet Union jubilantly announced that their scientists have definitely picked up alien signals from other intelligent beings. The feat was performed by three top grade Russian astrophysicists who said, we have been receiving radio signals from outer space and bursts lasting from two to ten minutes their creator their consistent 
their character and their consistent pattern and their regular transmissions leave us in no doubt that they are of artificial origin that is they are not um, natural signals but have to be transmitted by civilized beings with sophisticated transmission equipment if you doubt their word and think they are over excited visionaries it would be like doubting the word of Dr. Edward Teller and Dr. Harold Uri, Uri of the United States or any of our top flight scientists um, oh boy Vesvolod Tchaikovsky is the director of the research Rad Radiological Institute in Gorky uh, Nikolai, Nikolai <laughs> Kardashev is lab laboratory chief of the Institute of Space and Research of the USSR. I have butchered that guy's name. I'm sorry. Academy of Science, higher uh, than just you can hardly get in Russia. Samuel uh, Kaplan, Kaplan is also eminent as chief astronomer at Gorky University. But with their electrifying revelation came a baffling and perhaps significant mystery. In their own words, so far, we have not been able to estimate or establish exactly from where the signals emanate, but we can say the source is located in our own solar system. Not from a distant star. but from within our own solar system that would place the alien transmitter somewhere within 3.5 billion miles the orbit of Pluto our outermost planet or they can't figure it out what it is to be honest with you but even more startling when their peculiar qualifying by the way I don't think these starting I think they're like like miles away I think they're like within hundreds of miles away. That's my personal opinion. If I've been able to film things, I've been able to film the stars and planets like Mars or uh, wherever, and I can find entities. No, no, no. These things are not far. They are not light years away. But that's my opinion based on my own research and my own camera. Saying that, if we can just if bring everything down, bring other numbers down, bring it down to realistic, okay? And then it start making sense here. Okay, um... All right, it is possible that they, the signals, come from upper layers of the atmosphere. They could be coming from the upper layers of our atmosphere, too, by the way. Uh, that would place the source far closer to the Earth, depending on what it, what is meant by upper layers of the atmosphere. And immediate, yes, right, See, that's right, that's right. They jerk around with that meaning, too. And immediate thought comes up. But relax, the Soviets stated positively, for the moment, one thing is sure. The signals do not come from satellites launched from Earth. One, and this was back then, by the way, so we're now talking, what, 63 years ago or 60-some years ago? 50 years ago? 50, whatever, something like that. One always has to read between the lines of any tight-lipped Soviet report and, of course, American report or anybody else's report. And the last phrase uh, is, again, peculiar. Not from any Earth-launched satellite, they say, which leaves it open that it could be from an alien satellite within the Earth's vicinity that would tie, it, tie in with the signals coming from the upper atmosphere. What is the answer to the riddle? What are the Soviet scientists trying to say without giving too much away? 
do they simply do do they imply that a robot probe sent from a distant star is orbiting within the, the solar system and sending us messages or is it a UFO or could it be part of the simulation in the matrix and there's something way up there a bunch of things up there that are watching us on the other side that you know how it's veiled right now with the, the the sky blue and then the stars that beyond the stars you know which are really close to the sky blue and there's a bunch of things that are just having fun with us maybe we ourselves live in a terrarium and maybe we live in a giant zoo and we don't even realize it <clears throat> or is it a UFO like US gov like the US government Soviet government has taken great pains to deny the existence of many reported UFOs and flying saucers. Are they too ashamed now to admit that they were wrong and that their a radio telescope picked up UFO signals? More likely they are too canny to call it a UFO because they need stronger evidence. Though the Russians seem positive about the signals, there has been no confirmation yet from any US or European scientists as of this writing. Before you read this, however, the signals may have been corroborated with worldwide scientists tuning them in and no doubt trying to translate them with computers. And that would mean that the theory of hybrid man and colony Earth is boasted high, boosted high in probability. But even more of a bo boast, uh, boost comes from one of those three scientists listening to the arresting words of Professor Nikolai Kardashev, Kardashev, so Nikolai, Nikolai Kardash, Kardashev of the Soviet Space Institute. I also believe there is intelligent life elsewhere, but unlike most of my colleagues, I think there is only one other civilization in our galaxy, a super or super civilization. It would be millions, even billions of years older than we are fast, uh, fantastically more developed scientifically to the beings of this civilization we would be insects or a colonial anthill. Why would Professor Kardashev make such a peculiar statement? Surely he does not believe that the only Earth independently developed civilization besides that single super civilization Surely he does not believe that the only Earth independently developed civilization besides that single super civilization. Unvoiced in his opinion for fear of ridicule, ridicule, no doubt, must be implied belief in the sun. I've opened up the blinds now I have just glare of the sun. Hey, double edge there. All right. Unvoiced in his opinion for fear of ridicule, no doubt, must be implied belief that the original great civilization then spread out and populated and colonized the rest of the galaxy. If his suspicions are based on any sort of clues at all in the astronomical uh, work, then certainly the theory of a colonized Earth, if not hybrid man, is bolstered at a top level of science. Now another problem enters the picture. Even if there are civilized worlds, how could their spaceships ever have reached Earth? By the law of averages, the nearest inhabited worlds might be at least 100 light years away and more likely over a thousand light years away. A light year, of course, is the distance of light travels in a whole year at a fantastic speed 
at 186,300 miles per second. And if you believe that, I got an oceanfront property to sell for you in Arizona. So believe that all you want. But that's just a belief system that is more like just like faith. It's like so many other things. You had to have faith in it. Imagine it and it will come true. God have mercy. Making a total of just under 6 trillion miles. Oh yeah, there you go. If the, if the light is the fastest thing in the universe, according to Einstein's relativity, then Starman would require 100 to 1,000 or even 25,000 years to get to Earth. Such trips would, in short, occupy lifetimes. This seems to make the Earth colony concept unattainable. Not to mention if you're using mechanical shit, it only lasts more than a few years before it falls down, no matter what it is. Even the greatest of things that you would design, it would take, it would, <laughs> you would have to do something that's more etheric, spiritual, interdimensional, and then mechanical to travel. That's how I see it. This seems to make the Earth colony concept unattainable, but only at first glance. If the high-speed barrier cannot be broken, let us list some of the possibilities. First, the star man, men are long-lived with lifetimes of thousands of years or more. Why not if the Bible lists it uh, Methuselah, Methuselah's light living for centuries on end, In that case, a trip from the star within 100 light years would take only one-tenth of their lifetime, comparable to some of the years-long sailing trips unhesitantly made by Magellan and others to explore the Earth. Two, starmen put themselves into hibernation or suspended animation for a bulk of the trip. Thus, they li could live blissfully asleep for a century and even 100 centuries and wake up only uh, uh, upon uh, arrival on earth and remember such a major project of colonizing another distant world would call for those and similar heroic measures and would take an immense amount of money resources and time and why can't we start thinking about multidimensional things why can't we start thinking about multiple uh, uh, portals and that we're just if you can through out of body experiences astral projecting or whatever maybe that's the real source of all that I mean, maybe there is something why do we have to you know I think what they tell us is wrong on the in television and in the, and in the movies they try to tell us one thing and give us maybe a nugget of truth but it's all propaganda it's to keep us from knowing the truth I'm three the time dilation angle of Einstein's relativity points out that the closer the spaceship gets to light speed itself, the more time slows down, and the more likely that damn thing's going to fall apart in a million pieces, by the way. Anyways, I put that in there. For the crew aboard, there have been many examples given in literature of how space travelers go at 99% of the light speed and would only age 10 or 20 years. While the planets of the departure would experience aging going by, though a rather unsatisfactory solution to long-range space travel with a p potential of returning to their home planet to find it at an age ahead determined starman could be willing to come and colonize Earth under those conditions. But uh, the answer may be far simpler than that. If the light speed barrier of unknown worlds, science is, is fallacious. That's it. It's if it's fallacious. If it's false, which it is. It is fallacious. Good job, boys. And just as scientific orthodoxy at one time rather recklessly said that aircraft could never fly that the sound barrier could not be broken 
that rockets could never reach the moon, so today the science established opposes the possibility that light barrier that the light barrier could be broken. It would, however, seem after a, to say that the world of science technology a million years old could have founded a golden way to speed through space at fantastic um, rates measured in multi light speeds or, and reach any world by they wish to any world they wish we will drop the matter there as to nebulous to pursue that's right if the starmen have been and are here does it matter how they got here yeah it does it is because it negates all the bullshit that's coming out of nasa that's what it does okay we're almost done here um however making it possible for starmen to go faster than light in their vast planet hopping project is of if of interest only if the starman truly exists and that the that brings us back to the question of whether there is life and particularly intelligent life in the universe a question that may soon be solved there is a sort of exobiology race going on today exobiology is the embryo science of extraterrestrial life or life anywhere else in the universe than on earth so far it is almost entirely theory um, I mean that's no this book was written 50 years ago almost <clears throat> with little empirical experimental and material proof the radio astronomers are racing to pick up the first uh, provable intelligence signal the space cloud um, bio astronomers are seeking to nail down the existence of live molecules between stars the meteor meteorite specialists are attempting to clinch the fossil evidence of life in stones from other parts of interstellar life space and the planetary scientists are striving to detect the first true signs of non-earth life on planets of our own solar system we will take up this last category in the next chapter for it may furnish us the first thrilling proof that life can spring up in whatever fashion on another world than our own at the end of chapter two and chapter three will be planetary clues it's interesting i don't agree with much of what he says but you know what it doesn't matter because there are nuggets of truth and i mean this is this whole thing about studying even the things you don't want to study to get a bigger picture and the bigger picture for me is that we're dealing with something that he's not talking about <laughs> but what do i know what do I know? You're going to try. Go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. If you're going to try, go all the way. This could mean losing girlfriends, wives, relatives, jobs, and maybe your mind. See?